Hi everyone, this is Tom with the LSE recap of this week. The LSE just had its second week of the Summer Split playoffs played, which means there were again three series, so a lot of action to unpack. Let's just get right to it. On the first day on Friday, we had Shao Knoff here taking on Mad Lions. Mad Lions came down from the upper bracket after a loss to G2, and Shao Knoff here came from the, uh, from the lower bracket and had won against SK Gaming. This was the series with most on the line directly because this was directly a clash for the fourth spot at the League of Legends World Championship. So with this in mind, there was a lot of pressure on both teams. Now, Mad Lions opened this series with a surprise Akali blind pick for the mid lane, which is something we hadn't really seen up until then. It they followed it up with um, Jin and Nautilus in the bot lane, whereas Shokan of Fear went for a much more standard uh, composition there than Ash and Tom Kange and Oriana, for example. Um, it didn't go too well in the beginning for Mad Lions. They had two early deaths from Shadow, who wasn't really having his game this game. Um, they tried to gank the bot lane, which was turned around nicely by Shokan of Fear. And once he tried to gank in the mid lane, but uh, Gilius was there to stop that. Now, they did come back from that in, in that game, they had two kills back, but uh, Schalke in the meantime got the Drake and the Herald, and it was really these objectives that were just going Schalke's way, and overall you were feeling that they had the better uh, preparation for this game in particular, and also their team was much more in sync and playing together better than uh, Mad Lions was. So it was a back and forth for a while, but eventually it, you know, Mad Lions just got trampled a bit by, by Schalke and Ophir. Uh, there was a fight at the second Cloud Drake, which went completely in Shalka's favor because it was a 4v5 and um, um, Humanoid was just wandering off in another lane and TP'd into the fight too lately. And directly off that, Shalka went for a Baron fight and we'll have a clip of how that went for them. They forgot about the dragon. They said, let's chase down, get the smite, because now for 30 seconds, Shadow is Baron. dead. And they're running for the Baron. Gillies just came off the respawn. Uh, Abdagi teleported in. Now Odwamne can teleport in, too. They're just going to try to force yet another fight 5v4. There's no cleanse on Karzi. There's no flash on Karzi. He cannot afford to overstep here. The good news is he's Jin. He has the curtain call. He can poke a little bit from a distance. This Humanoid is crazy. Alt will be coming off of cooldown Watch shortly, on the flank. as well as the flash. But the Tom catch is going to be disastrous. But no, the shockwave goes wide. That's going to be a big deal. Dreams has already used to devour. They can't save anyone else. Odawami on the backside looking straight for Kaiser or Karzi rather, gonna get run down, the rest of the team now retreating, Shalka holding on, but their biggest enemy now is the Baron in the pit, they are gonna be able to finish it, that is disaster for Mad Lions. So from there, Mad Lions had to do something, they had to try and find a way back into the game. They tried to set up a gank at the Cloud Drake, with Shadow waiting in the bush for what felt like ages, um, but, you know, they, they pivoted then and tried to gank in the mid lane, but it was just all horribly wrong, Shadow entered the fight, there was no follow-up, from Mad Lions and Mad Lions just got annihilated. And from there on, um, Shoka just pushed out the game and finished it. And I think in this game in particular, Neil on the bot lane of Shogun of Fear was having a really good performance. I think so far in, in this split, we've mostly been talking obviously about God Gilius and Faker Dage um, in the mid lane and with uh, Odo Amne sometimes stepping up as well. But um, for in this game in particular, Neil was playing really well. So with a defeats in their shoes, um, Mad Lions had to do something about this and they started the game with uh, uh, the second game with again with an Akali mid blind pick and that was a bit surprising because you think okay maybe you spice things up a bit and see if a completely different strategy worked but th they decided to go with the Akali in the mid lane again and this time there was uh, Shadow on the Lee Sin which is obviously um, his most played champion and what he's most known for as well so uh, there was a bit more power there from Shokan of Fear and it did go much better and especially um, Shadow on his Lee Sin was just playing really well. He was playing against uh, Gilius on a Skarner and in the top lane for example you had um, Odo Amno on a Camille which just, I don't know, it just didn't click for Shokan of Fear. So it, during the game um, there was a much better start, Shadow got a kill, Karsi also got a kill, they got two drakes, a much better performance from them overall. Humanoid was sitting at a 3-1 score at 15 minutes on his Akali, so they just had this really strong early game. And they didn't really let this go, ever. Um, they had better team fights and knowing how to stall the game um, in case Shokan of Fear tried to aggress and not all Mad Lions team members were there. And the best 
example of one of those good team fights was a top lane fight uh, at around 22 minutes into the game. They have these scaling compositions, but they still like to fight you. They still try to make plays, and they're going to try to do that again here with Humeroid in the top lane. Pull back, though. Oh, Shuriken flip will ferry him out to safety. Now gets to buy a bit more time. Moving forward into the TP. Some fancy footwork coming for Humeroid. Just sticking the shot as long as possible. Gilly's is going to pull him back, but now Aromi's in the midst of everyone, but it's still just a 2v4. Maybe not what they're looking for, but Humanoid still manages to make it out. He goes golden, he cancels out the ultimate. Kaiser going to step forward to try to body block. Ooh. Humanoid is still alive. Now that's a Houdini you can be proud of. Shadow moving in with Kaiser as well on the backside. Meanwhile, Arome fishing for a fight, buying just a little bit more time. Neon not doing the damage necessary to get anything done. Abadage running for the hills, the double kill for Shadow. And meanwhile, here comes the Ash on the bottom side. Karzi looking to play cleanup. One volley, one slow. That's all it's going to take to run down the rest of Shalka as Karzi runs forward here. And Odawande, the last man standing. From there on, Mad Lions kept ramping up the pressure, they got the Dragon Soul, um, they dove into the base of Shogun of Fear and just simply ended the game like that. In the third game, 1-1, one one, um, this time Gilius was on the Lee Sein and Shadow was playing on the Lilia. And Mad went for um, an early blue buff steal from Shogun of Fear, it was successful for them, and Shadow actually just got a very early lead over Gilius in the jungle, which snowball throughout the game and um, eventually you know got G uh, shadow so much far far ahead of Gilius that he was just much more impactful in the game but during the game um, Mad Lions just had the upper hand and um, yeah it wasn't nearly as explosive as all the other games were um, much more quiet and uh, but, but the fights that were there mostly were going Mad Lions way and this went on for a while but around mid-20 minutes, um, the, the chaos kind of broke out and uh, team fights were going back and forth. Um, then Mad Lions would win one, then Shao of Fear would win one. This actually seemed like an opportunity for Shao of Fear to maybe climb back into the game. But whenever they had done that, Mad Lions would just win the next team fight. So that it would basically all balance out. Um, Mad... Lions overall, I would say, looked a bit cleaner. They were on top and especially, as I said earlier, Shadow on the Lilia had a standout performance. Very clean from him and using this advantage that they gained in the early game, they snowballed this through and uh, closed out the game. Now, two and one down, Shao of Fear obviously had to do something uh, to, to spice things up. And um, they went with Odo Amne on a cannon, which is one of his you know signature champions almost he's very um, avid uh, cannon player and met lions again with with um, Akali and they went with Alilia in the jungle and this time they had Orome on the Camille so even though Shokan of Fear had to do something and had to adjust and had to try figure something out for them to work uh, it, it just didn't come together and I, I want to give a special shout out to Odo Amne, who was playing his heart out and he was the factor holding Shokan of Fear into the game for as long as they did. But eventually it was just Mad Lions coming together as a team, mostly, and you could see that uh, Shokan of Fear really just started to crumble. It was really disappointing to see, obviously, after the Shokan of Fear miracle run, that they were going down so quickly. Um, it's... Yeah, I... I I, I imagine that it was just the pressure getting to them throughout the summer split, the regular summer split. They could just play with nothing to lose, right? They were in the 10th place. They were 1 and 10 down in score. So for week 6, 7 and 8, they could just do whatever they wanted. And if they lost, well, they were at the bottom anyway. But now that everything was on the line, it seemed like the pressure was really getting to them. And sadly, they lost uh, for them. But Mad Lions, the rookie squad that performed so well in spring and at the start of the summer split as well especially they closed out the game and secured their ticket to worlds now on the second day we had the clash of clashes in the lec it was g2 versus Fnatic. this was obviously a very anticipated match given the historical context and given the, the rivalry between these teams but also because uh, during the regular split the summer split these two teams had not been performing super well but then in the playoffs they had all of a sudden uh, stepped it up massively with g2 looking incredibly strong against mad lions and Fnatic just simply stomping rogue um, mercilessly so in the first game we had a few noteworthy picks we had uh, caps on the akali they went with a similar strat as mad lions where went in the mid lane there 
Uh, but Whippo went on the Rengar in the top lane versus Wounders Nar. And this was an interesting laning phase in the first 10 minutes. Uh, G2 got first blood, um, but Fnatic struck back with two kills of themselves. And uh, Wounder was sitting at a 2 1 score, Hela Sang was actually sitting at a 2 1 score. And at 20 minutes, Fnatic was definitely ahead in the game, winning more fights and, and dictating the pacing of the game, dictating the flow of the game, calling the shots, calling where the team fight would be, and G2 had to answer to them. But I will say that even during this game, it's, it looked like G2 was slowly finding their, their groove. And you know, when G2 gets into that rhythm, then that's where they really start rolling. So. Um, this was really important for Fnatic to shut down, and they did actually. Um, they had a very good fight and rudely stopped G2's groove. To do is steal all these topside camps and potentially get a tower, and that's why Fnatic are now charging at Yankos. Okay, Yankos has already used that flash. The Ash Arrow comes through as well. There's a follow up teleport coming from Fnatic now to fight on multiple fronts. Yankos is already down. The Onslaught of Shadows comes up. That buys so much time as Caps is fleeing and afraid and terrified. He's forced to dash over the wall to safety to escape for his life. The Wonder! The Gnar into the wall! Wonder finds the double stun, but he's shut down. Reckless gets another. Dredge line onto Mickey. He goes down as well. What a beautiful bait and switch. Now Whippo's in here. He's charging down perks. He'll go down. Caps executes to the Baron. It's an ace for Fnatic. The formula of this game was very simple. G2 had very little to say from here on, and Fnatic just won. Then in the second game, G2 shifted into draft. They banned the Ash, which they had allowed to go through in the opening game, and picked Senna and Leona versus uh, Fnatic's Jin and Nautilus. Um, Fnatic did get first blood on the Shen, so it looked like Fnatic had a bit better start, but G2 got the first Drake in the Herald, so they were trading these kills for the objectives. It was overall a much better showing from G2 in this game. Um, Hillesang was especially having a more difficult game. He did, you know, make it a bit more difficult for himself as well, as he uh, has a tendency to do sometimes. Um, just getting caught out in G2, just punishing his positioning. Uh, positioning. Um, G2, I think, had a stable game, not very dominant for like the in the early game, but you could really like for me at least there was really a moment where they like flipped the switch and said, okay, we're done with this and we are gonna punish Fnatic. Shutting down a lot of the value of an Akali Shen combination. Oh, that's a big ult. Lane. That could be. Is indeed. Lullaby can come yeah, forward. Nemesis is the trigger. The shockwave catches too. Hillisang uses the dredge line to escape to safety, but there's the dash forward. Whippo gets caught and pulled backwards by Yankos. The slam dunk showstopper sends Whippo back to the fountain, but the curtain is called by Reckless, and it will slow down the siege. Here comes Wando. He's got the shock blast under the tower, and the center plate finds a target. That is so much damage on the self Yankos takes him out and they're not done yet. Yankos and Wonder pushing forward. Two quick towers and two quick kills for G2. It seemed like G2 had just come online all of a sudden. Um, Fnatic was showing poor team coordination again and Reckless was just not, uh, as an individual player, was a bit invisible actually. So it looked like Fnatic was going back to that Fnatic that we saw struggle during the summer split. Um, I have to say though, on uh, G2 side, Caps was playing incredibly well. Honestly, a monster. 7-0 uh, at the end of the game and Wunder in the top lane as well. Played incredibly well, much like he did against Mad Lions. Was very impactful once again. So very strong showing from G2 in game number two. In the third game, um, it was a much slower early game. Uh, both teams were a bit just farming. Um, G2 did get a Infernal Drake at 7 minutes into the game. Um, Fnatic got first blood just moments later. So it's the, while the very early game was pretty slow uh, and, and not um, as explosive as maybe you could expect from especially a team like G2, um, it once again looked like uh, <laughs> uh, it, G2 would slowly kind of snowball the game eventually, but instead they all of a sudden just went on a tear they, they just smelled blood right Fnatic was just not playing the game together as they were in game two and um, fights would continuously go into G2's way um, Caps was once again here absolutely ruining Fnatic's hopes and um, it, they had a massive lead they had a decent gold lead they were already knocking on the door of the inhibitor but there was really a turning point in this game 
when uh, G2 overstayed their welcome and got punished incredibly hard for it. There is a bit of a redemption story as Nemesis will look for a shockwave here. One of the more criticized players on Fnatic. He gets his first kill of this game, but at what cost? Now the inhibitor turret will go down. The inhibitor is going to be focused on this. There's nothing that Fnatic can do to stop this. So it looks initially like Pokes is just running it down, but he's just buying time. As look, G2 may actually even go for the end. People aren't even recalling yet on Fnatic. This is insane. Here comes Hilly. He gets the double fight. Death sentence as well with the ignite burning. That will be a kill. Now Wonder is in trouble. Pops the powder kick. The Empress Divide comes back and Yankos goes forward to the showstopper. Selfmade has arrived and so has Nemesis. They get themselves the kill. They'll start to calm down as Fnatic will defend their base. They will be donated several kills and so yeah this closed not only the goal lead but also the kills on each teams and uh, this really allowed Fnatic to climb back into a game that should just have been won by G2 easily if you know they hadn't been so greedy then perhaps then Fnatic would not have recovered mentally as well and um, yeah this time they did and to their credit obviously they, they really realized okay this is our window of opportunity to take control and they went for a Baron, G2 tried to contest it but inted and Fnatic went from being 10-1 down in kills at 17 minutes to being 12-10 and 10 at 23 minutes. So in 6 minutes they had almost entirely closed that gap. Uh, it was a complete fiesta honestly. Um, <laughs> it, it was um, back and forth uh, with teams overstepping, making mistakes and not at all a game I wish uh, anybody would write home about because there is not much to write home about in, in terms of a high level League of Legends play here because there were just many mistakes and uh, while it was entertaining it was a bit disappointing to see obviously for G2 first of all you know supposed to be the best team in uh, Europe um, or at least one of the two now and they they just throwing away a lead like this but also from Fnatic you know even though they eventually won the game they just rolled to it in a very messy way and uh, yeah it's it just better to I think completely forget about this game and just move on to game number four because in game number four Fnatic was sitting at a 2-1 score they had one game left to close out the series and um, go directly to the grand finals of the summer split now this is a bit of a Fnatic classic where they pick Kassadin against G2 and it never works out for them so I don't know why they keep doing this but I did it once again um, and Caps was on the LeBlanc and so yeah historically not a good pick for Fnatic at all but Fnatic got a bit of a better start than, than anticipated they, in the early game they actually got a bit of a lead a few kills there um, and this is where they fail to show up and this is where I guess the Kassadin curse uh, of Fnatic um, got to them because um, they just failed to snowball the game completely uh, which is weird because Kassadin is supposed to be bad early on and then when he hits level 16 he nukes the enemy team but now he had an early lead and actually was performing much better than expected and they just failed to use that so G2 got back into the game they turned the game around and Fnatic just had nothing to say in the middle and late game. Very dominant showing from G2 overall and uh, I don't think this game in particular had many super standout fights because it was just simply G2 completely stomping uh, Fnatic in this game. The fifth game, oh man, the fifth game. 2-2 uh, two two score for G2 and Fnatic and the direct spot at the Grand Finals on the line. And this really... Um, was this was quite a match and i do recommend watching all of it i cannot uh, say enough how import like how exciting it is and how much of a nail biter this game turned out to be so if you want to catch the full emotion and the full roller coaster ride of this game please watch it all um you don't even have to watch the first four games just knowing that it's two and two it was an incredibly tense game uh, nemesis uh, went on the Lucian, uh, Caps went on the LeBlanc and G2 had a lot of pressure especially um, in the mid uh, lane early on. Jankos killed Nemesis for the first blood so that was a good start for G2 especially because um, Lucian is supposed to be very good early game and then drop off later a bit but um, he didn't so you'd think that with that start G2 could uh, snowball a bit and 
it, it did fall a bit quiet there. I would have liked to see a bit more aggression from G2 maybe, trying to find those extra kills and really secure that early game and, and go from there. But it was a bit quieter, um, not many kills uh, early on. And G2 getting a lead, I would say, but Fnatic was not too far off. So not the game wasn't won uh, at all yet. Now, I think this lead got closed and a really big turning point in the game where Fnatic said, okay, now we need to do something back is when G2 once again overextended. They, um, whereas in game three, they overstayed their welcome in the bot lane inhibitor. Now they were pushing the top lane and just, yeah, well, let's see what Fnatic did about this. And that's why I feel like G2 are in an advantage state because all the outer turrets have fallen is because it opens up so much more of the map for them to oh. find picks and find these collapses onto Fnatic. Weppo, no flash available to him, but Fnatic is nearby. Hillison, can he find the Lantern? Not because of the Showstopper. There's a Winter's Bite tag down and somehow Whipper stays alive just a few seconds longer. He will finally get taken out. Death Sentence connects onto Mickey. And that's a lot of damage coming out from Reckless, but the rest of Fnatic cannot find the target. So yet. Body slam comes down. One for one. Top for support. Teleport coming out now from Nemesis. Nemesis, he has calling. In the middle of the G2 members. Arden Blaze, as well as the Reckless Pursuit, get used. Dashing and dodging around. Using that passive, Wonder will likely fall as well. And Fnatic turn around the engage to find three kills. So yeah, this was really a big turning point for Fnatic and they were the ones tasting blood actually. They really pushed back into the game and as I said earlier, I think I, I would love to show more highlights but I don't want to take away too much from, from the experience and uh, I, I've shown highlights in other games before and I've also said that um, you should just really watch the, the full game but you you really 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 should I think it's a must watch not only for the excitement but to follow the storylines as we head into the final weekend of the playoffs uh, this week and will crown a summer split champion really important uh, to catch up with this so if you uh, don't want to watch uh, the full game I will still continue to, with my comments so what happened from here on is that um, skirmishes just simply kept going on. Fnatic was not scared of G2 at all. This is what they really like to see because I think in the past when Fnatic played against G2, especially in the spring split as well, you could see that Fnatic was just playing hesitantly and not, um, you know, not respecting their own strength as much and giving G2 way too much credit for, you know, a, a perceived skill gap or whatever so i really like that um fanatic kept pushing kept applying the pressure on the um on, on g2 and i think that there was just so, there was just so many things that went on like um I, there was a point where fanatic pushed in the bot lane looked like they would end um four members of g2 that only young was alive on the set and there was a huge minion wave, um, many members of Fnatic right there. Um, they were just going straight for the Nexus turret, but Yankos ran in with the set, ulted um, into the middle of uh, Fnatic, landed on the minions, used his uh, set clears to clear the minion wave. And l just like that, G2 was still in this game. And, the, you know, that was just one of the points where you could see that neither of these teams would just easily let this go. Now, towards the end of the game, I will say that Fnatic looked much stronger than G2. G2 seemed to be a bit more desperation mode rather than playing this confident, um, secure, uh, but explosive style that they usually have where they just simply outwit and outplay the opponent. They did try to, though, actually. Um, there was a point where... Fnatic was going for the Dragon Soul, um, and G2 knew uh, that the, the Drake would be coming up. And before going to the Drake, Caps wandered into the top lane trying to get a kill onto Nemesis. With you know, with a LeBlanc versus Lucian, he should easily get. However, uh, Nemesis was there uh, in in shape and landed two quick crits to end that fight. So with that, Fnatic had a big advantage in going into the the Drake fight, and they secured this. There was another point later into the game where Caps tried to backdoor, but Nemesis had um, outsmarted him there and he had already teleported back, which is waiting there in front of the Nexus like a final boss and uh, just saying no to, <laughs> to Caps and stopping him there. So 
it was Fnatic in the end who won the game. They broke, I think, like it's 874 days since Fnatic had won against G2 in a best of series. So very impressive that they finally managed to close it out against G2, though um, not all the games were of high level. You should definitely watch it. And I cannot, um, you know, highlight enough how much I would recommend watching that fifth game because it had everything. So definitely watch that one. On the third day, we had Rogue versus the Mad Lions. And this game definitely didn't matter anymore for World Spot, but did matter for the World's seeding. The loser of this match would go through the playing stage, whereas the winner of the match was guaranteed to be the third seed of Europe and therefore directly qualify for the League of Legends World Championship group stage. The favorites heading into the series, I suppose, were Mad Lions a bit because they had on Friday defeated Shokunal Fear with relative ease in 3-1 fashion, whereas Rogue was still coming off the back of a Fnatic loss. And uh, heading into the series, many people were wondering if Rogue could actually adapt and adjust their strategies because against Fnatic they had shown us only the style that they had been playing all summer split long. So many people were questioning if Rogue not only could adjust things but if they were actually worthy contenders to go to Worlds as well. Because if you get 0 in the first series and an 0 in the second series you have not won a single game in the playoff stage. So I think then it would have been legitimate criticism. However... Rogue came out surprising. In the very first game, they already um, they already came out with a Lucian Evelyn pick, which they had learned from Fnatic, I suppose. And yeah, they, they just had a really strong start on this. So um, Larson on the Lucian had two early kills. And from there on, this guy was just on an absolute tear. But I have to say, inspired Evelyn, as he said in an interview with me earlier in this split, one of his favorite champions uh, to play, he was not uh, too shabby either. Setting up kills, uh, setting up ganks, uh, applying pressure on mad lines all over the map. And uh, yeah, so so Larson looks strong, um, Inspired looks strong, but on mad line side, maybe somewhat surprisingly, it was Arome who got two kills in return in top lane. So it wasn't um, a, a blowout performance in the early game, but it did turn out to be a blowout performance this game. Um, super dominant showing from Rogue. And I think it was the best um, game I may have seen them play. Uh, the, the most dominant game maybe I, I've seen them play this split altogether. Because from the start to the finish of this game, they just had shifted their gameplay style. They were applying pressure on the mad lines. And I think the best way to show that is through this clip. Yeah, that was kind of... You know, his... Oh, hang on, one sec. First I'm going to watch this uh, execution. Yeah, okay, so back to what I was saying. Uh, this is quite an <laughs> uncharacteristic performance from Shadow. Uh, and some might say this is uncharacteristic from Inspired, as man picks up under the fight. Call of Force got going down, Aromia locked up in place, knocked up. There's the Dawning Shadow. The shot connects, and Finn gets the kill onto Aromia Larson. Now on his way, Shadow goes down. It's a double for Finn. Kazi flashes away, uses the heal as well. Just a couple of auto attacks would be enough, but they can't quite get onto Kazi as he pops out the volley. The hook comes out. Banda, flash, tongue lash as Kazi trying to escape underneath his. So, yeah, Rogue won the first game, and it was up to Mad Lions to come back with an answer. Um, they responded with a Lucian and Evelyn Ben. So, once again, just saying to uh, Rogue, okay, you, you've adapted this strategy, but how good are you with other champions than these two that you've clearly picked up? from uh, from Fnatic. Well, uh, Rogue was still very good. Rogue had Larson on a Syndra and Inspired on a Hecarim. And it was this mid-jungle duo again that was absolutely dominating. It, I, it sounds incredibly boring, but I have to say that um, in terms of competitiveness, maybe this was not the most exciting match because you want teams to go head to head. But Rogue, even though they weren't playing as cleanly maybe as they were in game one, I think uh, was absolutely uh, stepping up and absolutely proving the haters wrong that, uh, and, and showing that they can play more styles. Because once again, they were aggressive. They um, were 5-1 in, in, in kills early on in the game. Matt did push back, getting some time from Rogue. So, you know, 
if this would have gone to a very late game then maybe Mad Lions could have climbed back into the game but Rogue simply didn't allow it it was honestly um, a very um, strong showing I keep repeating myself but I, I, I still have uh, difficulty just fathoming how much of a shift this was from Rogue and how much they stepped up here um, but also it has to be said that Mad Lions was just playing horribly I think Shadow in the jungle had one of the worst series he's had in his career in the LEC but uh, Humanoid was also having a tough time in the mid lane um, playing playing Zoe um, Kaiser was having a tough time as, as Leona so this is all really tying into this performance and I'm you know Mad Lions obviously did have less time to prepare for Rogue specifically because they had to prepare for Shokan of Fear in order to even make it to Worlds so they probably um, used all their resources to focus on Shokan of Fear um, but even then just in terms of individual play it looked off um, and Rogue won the second game it was uh, they got themselves on a soul point and uh, Matt just had nothing to say in this game so in the third game, um, I would say Mad Lions had the most to say they had in this series altogether. Uh, once again, they, they banned Lucian the Evelyn. Um, Rogue um, on the red side had to ban the Caitlyn. And uh, they banned the Lilia from Shadow because that's one of his best champions at the moment, I would say. Uh, they have been banning that all series long. And they also banned the Akali. So they picked uh, Azure uh, for Larsen. They picked uh, Graves for Inspired and uh, on Mad Lion's side I think uh, one of the most interesting picks was uh, Shadow on the Nidalee which is a champion that we hadn't seen at all in the Summer Split altogether. Now um, Shadow once again just had a terrible terrible game. Um, really sad to see I, you know like he was voted as the best jungler of the regular Summer Split and I would absolutely agree with this because it's undeniable that he had incredible impact um, outplaying his opponent and showing that he is a top contender for uh, you know junglers in, in, in Europe altogether, maybe even at Worlds. But this series, he just was not there at all. He was uh, playing, getting caught out, going for engage he shouldn't go for, and really the losing factor in the end, I would I would say for for Mad Lions in this series. Now this game dragged on for a bit longer than the second game. And I think that's mostly to do that Rogue just didn't want to risk giving away the lead that they had gained early on. Um, Larson had on his Azir again a great performance, um, inspired on the Graves, was playing uh, well. But also Hansama on the edge was doing very well. And I think uh, Vander, like for the whole series, has been a bit of an underlighted player because he has Tom Kench, even though it's an incredibly boring champion to play. He was very clutch with uh, saving his enemies. Uh, saving his allies obviously and uh, being there to support them which obviously is his role but I think he allowed um, his team to position well because of his saves and because of his presence on the map so um, a very good performance from him now this game was very dominant um, from Rogue early on but as I said they played more calmly and I think um, this was you know they, they had very little to lose even if they would lose this game by playing too calmly they still have two at, at minimum two games to uh, close out the series so i don't blame them at all for this and especially because you saw that mad lines were incredibly uh having an incredibly difficult time the only player that definitely stood out to me for mad lines was carsey on the senna who was there picking up kills and was um the I would say the factor of hope maybe for, for Mad Lions. So if you would appoint any uh, player that was trying to save Mad Lions in this series, I would say it was Karzi. Um, overall, Rogue is incredibly strong. And I think they had a bit of trouble with closing out the game, which is something that we saw from them in weeks 6, 7 and 8 in the LEC uh, regular split, where they would get a lead but not um, have the pressure or not find the pressure. To close out this series and uh, that all was thrown overboard uh, towards the end of the game when Larson just simply had enough and well let's watch this clip. Stopped by Schalke in this very match Vedius and now they are trying to prove that they belong amongst the best. Arrow's gonna land. That's a big X-Flash. 
Death Charge coming out in the category actually in a really good position. Mad Lions trying to open up on the fight. Decimating Smash trying to zone, but look at how much damage Vanda's already taken. Hunt Summer, the Destiny on the back line as they look for the fight. Humanoids going in. He has the flank. He has the gold guard. He locks it straight onto Vanda. Minions are pushing the Nexus. Oh, Larson! The top! Mid laner statistically in the regular season, the mechanical god that is Larson steps up. He just dismantles Mad Lions. And yeah, from there on, Rogue pushed to end the game. A super uh, dominant showing from them and a 3 0 victory against Mad Lions. I think nobody had predicted this, uh, maybe not even Rogue, because there, the, the amount of dominance they showed just proved the haters wrong with um, who were criticizing them for not being able to uh, adjust their playstyle um, and also show that they were a legit first place uh, finisher at the end of the regular split and also a worthy contender to be sending to the world stage because at the worlds it's very important for you to adapt for you to um, just when you know that a strategy is not going well, which maybe they should have done earlier, but they ended up doing it after all and implemented it very strongly. So props to them. Uh, Mad Lions has to go to the playing stage now at Worlds, but maybe it's good for them to get that warm up against some minor region teams to get really a feeling in um, for the meta and for how they have to play um, in order to catch up and make it to the group stage. That is it for the LEC recap of this week. Let me know in the comments below which highlights stood out to you and also uh, what you thought were interesting moments or maybe uh, could have been done differently by some teams. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and also stay tuned for more content.